Can genetic testing help you find out how your body responds to different foods? One of the earliest references comes from the first century BC, where Lucretius noted that one man's food is another man's poison. What's good for one person might actually be harmful to somebody else. Well, we've come a long way. And with modern developments in molecular genetics and genomics, we can now pinpoint specific regions in the genome that can help us understand why some of us look and function differently, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. So single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs are the most abundant and best well characterized uh, type of genetic variation. And oftentimes they can explain why you know, some people have different eye color or different hair color. And of course, you can imagine if these uh, genetic alterations impact uh, an enzyme and its activity, then that could have a profound effect on how we metabolize the foods that we consume. So when we look to see where and how our genes can influence our response to diet, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, genes influence our likes and dislikes. Uh, genes code for taste receptors on the surface of the tongue that impact our um, sensory perceptions and uh, impact what we choose to consume. Genes can also influence our appetite. Uh, some people need more of a particular macronutrient to get the same satiating effect. And once the food is ingested, there's all kinds of genes that impact um, the metabolism, the cellular uptake, the absorption, the distribution, and the elimination of virtually everything that we ingest. So it's one thing to know how much of a nutrient a person is consuming. It's another thing to know how much of that nutrient actually reaches the target cell of interest. So one example that I want to give is uh, some of the work that we've put done in the uh, field of cardiometabolic disease. Uh, which is uh, currently the number one cause of death and, uh, and disability, not only in the United States, but in Canada and many other regions around the world. This study uh, published in JAMA a few years ago identified diet as being the most important uh, modifiable risk factor and responsible for roughly half of all cardiometabolic deaths. What wasn't clear, of course, is what aspect of the diet was responsible, and more importantly, in which individuals. So one aspect of the diet that we've been interested in for a long time now is coffee, which is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the world. And there have been dozens and dozens of studies looking at the link between coffee and cardiovascular disease. And not surprisingly, the results have been all over the map. Some recent studies uh, show a U-shaped or a J-shaped association between coffee and cardiovascular disease, suggesting that moderate consumption might lower your risk. And as you increase consumption, risk starts to go up again. Well, we were interested in figuring out if certain genes or genetic variations can explain why coffee might be good for some people and harmful for others. Now, when you look at a cup of coffee, it's a fairly complex beverage, all kinds of bioactive substances. Uh, some things like the polyphenols have antioxidant properties and might actually be beneficial. Other things like the diterpenoids that are known to raise LDL cholesterol uh, might not be so good. Uh, so it's a mixture of some good things and not so good things. We asked the question specifically, is caffeine a component in coffee that might trigger a heart attack? This is just the chemical structure of caffeine. Um, many people can't get their day started without a cup of coffee. Obviously many people have acquired a liking. Some will say even an addiction to consuming caffeine. The nice thing about how caffeine is metabolized is it's broken down almost exclusively uh, in the liver by the CYP1A2 enzyme. And that converts it into a water-soluble substance called paraxanthine. Then that's more rapidly broken down into other water-soluble substances and eliminated in the urine. Now, when we look at the gene that um, codes for this enzyme, there's a common polymorphism at this position. This RS number is a unique identifier for a specific 
single nucleotide polymorphism that has a profound effect on enzyme activity or inducibility as shown here on the y-axis. So as you know, we inherit one copy of most genes from our mother and one from our father. So if both of our parents gave us the A allele or the A version of this gene, that effectively makes us a fast metabolizer. We would have approximately a fourfold higher rate of breaking down and eliminating caffeine uh, compared to someone who has even a single copy of the C allele that we would consider a slow metabolizer. So we reason that if caffeine is a component in coffee that might trigger a heart attack, then we would expect the slow metabolizers to be at a higher risk, right? Because if they're less able to get rid of it, if it's going to have any harmful effects, it's going to be in those individuals where it sticks uh, around in their system and they're not able to get rid of it as efficiently. Now, initially, we thought that slow metabolizers just drank less coffee because if you know they're not able to get rid of it as quickly, it sticks around in the circulation longer. They don't need that second or third cup to maintain their buzz. But it turns out there was no difference in how much caffeine the fast and slow metabolizers consumed. And in hindsight, that's not really surprising because what you feel when you consume a caffeinated beverage are the stimulating effects of caffeine when it binds to the adenosine receptor in the central nervous system. Okay, you can't just feel how much is floating around in your blood or what your liver is doing. So that's important because oftentimes someone will say to me, oh, I'm definitely a slow metabolizer because if I drink a cup of coffee at you know, after one in the afternoon, it keeps me up at night or caffeine makes me feel jittery. Well, it doesn't mean you're a slow metabolizer. That means that you have a, a variation in the adenosine receptor gene that causes those stimulating effects, which are very separate and distinct from any effects on health outcomes. So uh, in our study, we conducted this case control analysis, looking at over 4,000 individuals uh, who uh, half of whom had a uh, an acute myocardial infarction, heart attack, uh, and then the other half were the controls. And before looking at genetics, uh, we just wanted to see the association between coffee and risk of MI. And we showed that those who drank four or more cups a day had a 36% increased risk of a heart attack. Uh, statistically significant, um, and this is the multivariate adjusted odds ratio. Now, the real question we wanted to ask was, is this increased risk due to caffeine? And if it is due to caffeine, we would expect the slow metabolizers to be at a higher risk. So when we stratified our population by fast and slow metabolizers, that's exactly what we found. On the left-hand side are the fast metabolizers, where you can see that moderate consumption, one or two to three cups a day, actually protects, there's a lower risk of having a heart attack. Whereas the slow metabolizers on the right-hand side, even as little as two to three cups a day, now uh, have a significantly higher risk. And those who drank four or more cups a day have almost a fourfold higher risk of a heart attack. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much again for being with us today. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you find it insightful, I invite you to leave a comment below and share it with someone who may find it interesting. I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you for watching and being a part of this vibrant community.